Well, I'm here in a, apparently a haunted hotel in Austin, Texas, That's right? With, with Chris Cole, the uh, Chief Investment Officer of Artemis Capital Management. Chris, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to have this conversation because I've, I've read a bunch of your stuff over the last few years, and it's it's resonated, resonated with me like like few other things I've read. So I'm, I'm excited to get this chance to talk to you. Perhaps if we can, just for the viewers that don't know who you are, we'll just run through your, your back, background history a little bit and then get into some interesting stuff about volatility. Sure. Um, so I'm the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Artemis Capital Management. Um, I founded Artemis in a bedroom in Santa Monica <laughs> after making um, uh, really large proprietary gains. Uh, and essentially, the money that funded Artemis it was essentially the money that was exponentially magnified from my personal account and, and um, in the 2008 crisis. So uh, Artemis was, was started with uh, my personal money and a little bit of money from my neighbor who's still an investor. <laughs> and um, we've expanded um, over the years, have begun to hire and move down to Austin to, to continue that expansion process. Artemis is a, a fund that focuses on long volatility trading. Yeah, it's, so, so when you get the money you're making in your bedroom, <laughs> what were you doing at that at that time? You were in college, or it's uh, no, it was not in college actually. So I um, I did work as a derivative structurer. Um, uh, so I worked in derivative structuring on the banking side, mainly in interest rate swaps and swaptions. And um, at the time, I developed a trading model around VIX futures and VIX options. That was a very new market, but I saw that there were parallels between between interest rate swaps and the VIX market. Um, so I built these algorithmic trading models and uh, I had clearance to do it through the bank because VIX was not a stock right. or a bond. It was a, So they had no problem with it. And I originally ran it systematically because I was, I was a full-time, sure. <laughs> I was working full-time. So it would rebalance these systematic trading strategies. And during the period of 07 to 2009, in a a very leveraged proprietary account really amplified uh, a small amount of money uh, exponentially, and that was the seed money for Artemis. Yeah. Um, got that audited, and then went out and 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 went out on my own. Now, you, when you when you're going into that that world, selling a volatility strategy to people, was that a good time to do it or a bad time to do it? Because the guys who had run volatility strategies had kind of peaked and were going down. How, how did you find actually raising the money for that strategy at the time? Yeah, I, I think it was really I. I first began to, coming out, I spent some time researching and testing using proprietary funds. So the period between really 2009 and 2010 was really a period of refining my ideas. Right. Um, and, and then from there, really officially launched the institutional product um, at the end of 2011. I always said that this is, there's an irony to this, because I said, if I had, if I had started the institutional product six months earlier, I think it would have grown substantially more because we would have had this tremendous performance during the, the yeah. period of, of the, uh, the crisis in, in 2011, in August. If I had started the fund six months later, I think I'd be out of business because right. I don't think investors would have been, uh, we went into a period of low vol and very kind of flat returns between 2013 and 2015. Yeah. And I don't think investors, uh, uh, many investors would have been able to sort of stay with the program. Well, I mean, vol is something that we've, we haven't had a, a too many chances to talk with people about, which is why I'm so, I'm so thrilled to get you here today, because it's, it's something that um, everyone's kind of aware of it vaguely. They kind of understand the concept of volatility as a noun, maybe not as an investment strategy. So, so talk a little bit about the strategies you run. Uh, and then I want to get into some of the stuff that's going on in the volatility world because it kind of seems to be conflicted at the moment. Sure. I think there's a lot of um, misconceptions about vol as an asset class. Um, people tend to think that you there had to be one camp or the other. Yeah. You're either this short vol guy that's just picking up pennies in front of a steamroller and Eventually, you look like a genius for many, many years, and then you blow up, and Nassim Taleb screams at you. Right. Um, or you're this long ball guy, and you bleed, and you bleed, and you bleed, and then one, once in a blue moon, you make a ton of money, but that's not repeatable. Um, Artemis was really founded on this idea that there is a middle ground, where we are biased towards convexity. We're biased towards trying to create returns, portfolio changing returns in a period like 2008, in a period like 1928 or 87. But we're trying to find a way to carry yeah. much more efficiently. 
So the problem with a tail risk fund is if you're down 10 or 15% a year, you're down 50%. By the time you hit your hit the crisis, you make 100%. Yeah, back to what you're, you're back to square one. The idea being with a long ball fund is you use relative value volatility arbitrage principles and timing in order to have a return profile that's much more much more neutral to even slight positive carry during bull markets, while at the same time retaining that convexity exposure to do really, really well during the worst period of markets. So you know, when, when, you, when you say that, it sounds so simple. You go, yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. It's a really tough thing to do, right? To, to carry that, to be able to be able to bleed away and keep that funded, it's a really tough thing to do. It's a hard, it's a hard yeah. thing to conceptualize and it's a hard thing to kind of imagine within the portfolio context. Um, but what's amazing is that sometimes, even though volatility might be very low, when uncertainty is very, very high, that can give you an ability to carry long ball and tail risk positions in a way that's much more effective. Um, and I think I've given this analogy. Um, there's a paper I wrote recently. I talk about um, uh, Star Wars convexity and this concept of uh, what George Lucas did in 1976 as an analogy for long ball trading. Um, in many instances, a first order effect in markets and in life is something that's predictable. Uh, for example, if VIX is down at 12, you're not a genius for predicting that it will go to 17. Right. Those effects are pre-built into markets. Um, they're pre-built in, uh, in things like vol term structure, in vol skew. Higher order effects represent movements that are very difficult to conceptualize and are rare. Human beings conceive linear effects very easily, but we struggle to conceive higher order effects. An example of a higher order effect is the 20% drop in 1987, or the idea that vol rises 10 consecutive days. These are higher order effects. In, in, our, in, our, in life, in generally, people spend most of their time maximizing their exposure to linear movements and ignoring higher order movements. We oftentimes will seek to sell the first linear movement in order to finance the cost of the higher order movement. Um, one example of this was in 1976. So George Lucas did this with, uh, he was coming off of uh, success with American Graffiti. And at the time he went to the studio and he wanted to make a movie that was a space opera movie. And Fox Studios said, okay, this is a little bit risky, but we'll put up the money. He's a hot young director. Lucas said his going rate for his salary at the time was he could command up to about a million dollars. And he said, you know what? Give me only $150,000. Um, I'll give you a discount on my writing and directing fees. But instead, I want the merchandising sequel rights to his new movie, Star Wars. At the time, the Fox Studio executives, who had been reeling from the failure of uh, Dr. Doolittle in 1967, right. they tried film marketing, they tried marketing tie-ins, there was a huge write-down on toys from this movie, and they thought, why in the world would this guy accept an 85% discount in his salary to own these higher order rights on a failed concept? Obviously, that you know, eight hundred fifty thousand dollar trade that Lucas did turned into about forty five billion dollars yeah. and more. But the point is that this is this uh, Lucas was a brilliant volatility trader, right. right? What he did is he took a first order movement that could be conceived, which is this. He had this first order carry benefit. He forgo some of the carry benefit to own higher order movement. So in that sense, um, in terms of volatility, the way that that type of trade might be structured is you might have some negative delta exposure, but you'd have positive gamma or positive d gamma d vol or positive d vega d vol. These higher order derivatives or excuse me, higher order sensitivities where in the event markets move tremendously uh, you have a nonlinear payout. 
But these are very hard for people to conceive. They can only be fixated on the first order effect, not the second, third, fourth order effect. And this is just one way of explaining how a fund like Artemis has been able to actually beat the average hedge fund dating back to um, 2012 while actually having negative correlation to the S&P and explosive performance during during periods of off markets. So this, this is what's very interesting. A couple of things you said there. First of all, about George Lucas being a great vol trader, because you wrote in um, the allegory of the, the volatility and the allegory of the prisoner's dilemma, which everybody watching this needs to find and read. We'll put a link to it in, in the transcript. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of work. And there are a couple of things you, in there you said, when you talk about George Lucas there, you said in that piece, you know, everybody's a volatility trader, but only some people realize it. And when I read that, the bells are going off in my head left and right because that's that's exactly right. We're all trading volatility. We think we're buying stocks, we're buying currencies, we're selling commodities. We're all trading volatility. H how do you try and get people to understand this idea that you know what you're actually trading is volatility? Yeah, you know, this is this is so amazing because you sit back and institutions have all these asset class buckets. There's long. There's equity, hedge funds, credit. Let's just imagine that you knew nothing about finance and you're an alien that comes down from outer space. You have, no, you have nothing but data. You have nothing but data. So you look at these data streams and these return streams on how these different asset classes behave. And the world segments into two asset classes. Asset classes that have a short vol profile where they make steady returns with solid sharp ratios and then have large drawdowns. I mean, this would be an example of value investing. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong no. with value investing. This is It's a smart, short volatility return profile. But it's a form of short, short vol in that sense. Um, credit is a, another example. And then you have asset classes that are long volatility that would be, I mean, naturally, volatility trading is that. Yeah. But if you look at uh, systematic CTAs and contrarian global macro investors have that profile. The problem at the end of the day is that people artificially diversify their portfolio when in actuality, oftentimes they're just 99% in short vol and fail to conceptualize uh, the benefit of convexity in the portfolio, or even what asset classes represent a resource to, the, to, that, to that element. Yeah, I, you know, I, I interviewed um, a guy called Michael Green in, in uh, New York. Oh my, do, do you know Michael? He's a, yeah, he's a good friend, good friend. Brilliant, brilliant thinker. Well, well, brilliant right, I, mean, I, I, I pay money to sit and hear the two of you guys talking, because we, we spoke about this. We spoke well, actually, about... ironically, we were supposed to be in a call after this. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we, we, should, we just, just conference them in. You're going to hear a laugh, actually. So <laughs> it, we, I'm actually, we're, we're talking after uh, this. It's, it's funny because yeah, he, Michael and I spoke about this idea that people are selling vol and they don't even know they're doing it. No. Yeah. And, and you, know, you look at what's happened to the VIX, you look at how it's just repeatedly get crushed and crushed and crushed and crushed. In an age where the volatility, as people understand it outside the financial term, hasn't been higher in in you know living memory certainly. I mean, we're, we're post World War II. We've never seen the kind of pulls at the, at the geopolitical social fabric that we're seeing now. So try and help people understand how that's happening. That this vol is continuing to get crushed. Because I know in in the Prisoner's Dilemma, you wrote about central banks preemptive strikes, which I think is just such an important concept for people yeah. understand. Uh, Dorothy Thompson once said that peace is not the absence of conflict. Um, and I open up Prisoner's Dilemma by actually referencing a book called Command and Control, where this idea of a prisoner's dilemma where you have um, uh, different competing forces that um, where people would be best cooperating, but a force of tenuous competition creates an equilibrium. An example of that is an arms race. Yeah. Um, it creates a false piece, but underlying that false piece is tremendous volatility potential. So uh, Command and Control talks about an episode where there was a plane crash in North Carolina, um, and this uh, B-52 was carrying, uh, I think, two nuclear, nuclear weapons. Um, the only thing that prevented a explosion about 100 times the power of Hiroshima going off in rural North Carolina was a very low-tech failsafe. Very, very low-tech failsafe. There were six failsafe triggers 
All five of them went uh, failed, and there was only one that prevented this disaster from happening. Had that bomb had gone off, uh, it would have spread uh, radiation all across the eastern seaboard, including DC and New York. Um, it's not unfeasible to imagine that if an accidental explosion uh, accident happened in North Carolina, that it could have accidentally triggered Armageddon. In sure. A when, when, this was around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? This is yeah, in the '60s. That's yeah. right. That's in the '60s. So there were multiple. And this, this book, it's a true, it's a nonfiction, but it's the most uh, crazy horror, you know, novel you'll ever read right. because it details all of these accidents. Um, but the point is that there is this peace. We're not at war, but there's this this tenuous volatility hiding underneath the peace, this tail risk. And the analogy being is that we are at the end of a multi-decade debt binge monetary super cycle. And global central banks and governments have been taking tail risk. They've been pushing tail risk into the future. They've been bringing returns to the present. And what's occurred is that people have imagined that they're destroying risk. Right. You can't destroy risk. They've simply transmuted that risk, and they've actually even amplified it. And I think the Cold War is an example of where you can have this competition and incredible tail risk that's being driven by low volatility. Um, in today's market, we're sitting in a market where volatility persistence is at 88-year lows. Yep. Um, you can actually measure that using something called a Garch model. I'm not going to get into that. Okay. But 88-year lows in, in, in volatility persistence. Um, we have uh, extremely low equity volatility, extremely high mean reversion. Stocks, as measured by enterprise value to EBITDA, are at and price to sales and case seller PEs are at levels that have triggered previous depressions. Yes, yeah, and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And beyond. Fixed income, bond yields are at the lowest levels in human civilization. Yeah. Uh, we've only moved debt from the corporate balance sheet to government balance sheets and sovereign balance sheets. And now uh, sovereign debt are at the highest levels in really recorded modern history. Um, and there's limits to the efficacy of central bank stimulus. Um, and this is all occurring at a point where rising populism is potentially uh, going to cause the post bread and woods world order to come to a collapse. And this dynamic of the US protecting trade lines and in ensuring trade dynamics um, and also protecting the world in terms of military in exchange while we export our export our inflation and export our middle class, this multi-decade dynamic is coming to an end as populism is rising in the developed world. It is a perfect storm. So there is massive tail risk under the surface, but it's being hidden by, by this this competition of devaluation, the same in, this, in the same parallel that maybe the Cold War could be an, a, yeah. an analogy for. But you know, this, is, this is why I, I just love reading that piece so much, because it, it's testament to the success and failure of the central banks, right? They've been incredibly successful in creating this perception of de-risking, everything's fine, the can gets kicked, but it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And, and that success will ultimately be their biggest failure. We don't know when that will be, but to your point, the risk is there. You can't eliminate it. It will happen at some point. But to me, their greatest success, in parentheses, is convincing people, convincing markets, convincing investors that this is under control, convincing them that you can buy the dip, convincing them. And a lot of that comes from the point you made about this pre these preemptive strikes that they're having to do now because they can't allow anything, they can't allow a 5% drop in the S&P because where, where does that go once it gets out of control? Have they reached the end? Because I've, for almost two years now, I, I've been seeing you know, this is coming to an end. It just ekes forward. And a lot of that I think is because investors kind of do this. They don't want to know. It's, you know, it's don't ask, don't tell. 
if, if you tell us it's all right, even though we kind of feel uneasy, we don't have to invest like it isn't all right. But how close are we, do you think, to the end? I mean, it's an unanswerable question, but... The limits of my my understanding here, I I have been wrong about this for two years. Yeah, you'll be you know, And I've, yeah, and, and so, and it's possible if they, it's one of the one of the scenarios that I can imagine is a scenario where if they push through further deregulation, massive fiscal stimulus, we could see a blow off top the way we did in the late 90s. I would expect that to be a period of, most people don't realize the late 90s was a period of high. Incredibly ex- high volume. Right? Incredibly high volume. Yeah. yeah. We had um, uh, VIX averaged over 25. It's so over 10 points higher than where it averaged yeah. last year. We had um, multiple periods, including the, the 97 Asia crisis and then also the 98 Russia. S- s- a sovereign and default LCCM. LCCM. Yeah, yeah a volatility tested 40. In many instances, averaged over 30 for more than. So those periods of blow off market tops tend to where we have the right tail risk tend to have high vol. Yeah. Um, so it's it's possible to actually have high vol and high asset returns. We might see that type of environment repeat. Um, we could see an environment where um, if it's a more reckless U.S. presidency um, and uh, some of our China, uh, if we end up seeing a, a breakup at the European Union and China tries to get in front of a trade war with the U.S. by maybe even potential military action or, or there's a China blow up as a result of a trade war with the U.S. due to really kind of extreme reckless policies, we may see a dynamic where, um, where there is a crisis more immediately. Um, either way, I think, I think in stone, either way, the way we get there, I see higher vol. Um, it could break to the left tail. It could break to the right tail and then go to the left tail. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't see the equilibrium of volatility and high asset returns continuing. Yeah. This is amazing. Um, the statistic, um, I actually went back and tracked equity rep- returns going back 200 years. You know, All these institutions all want to go into index funds. Well, guess what? Indexation, um, beta has had one of the highest sharp ratios in over 220 years worth of data. So if you want to talk about buying the top right. of, I mean, you can look at periods like 1998, 99 that had high returns, but there was high vol. But the, the period really ending in uh, in early 2015 had one of the highest sharp ratios in in recorded equ- equity history, going back on a rolling three year period. Um, I mean, if you if you if you if you're chasing your own tail or driving with looking in the rearview mirror, of course you're going to want to go in index funds yeah. when it has the best performance. That's come from this idea of. Um, I think go off and kind of talk a little bit about how, what is driving this incredible mean reversion in markets? And you talk about uh, one of the concepts in the paper about preemptive strikes on yeah. risk. It used to be that central banks responded to economic conditions. So you had a recession, central banks would respond by lowering rates. Some point, really, I think, starting with Mario Draghi's whatever it takes speech, Central banks stopped responding to market conditions and started, or excuse me, stopped responding to uh, economic conditions and started responding to market conditions. They started, in essence, doing preemptive strikes on financial risk, um, understanding that asset prices uh, were driving this projection or this postmodern projection of what the recovery was. They began to treat asset prices rather than the fundamental conditions. This is analogous to giving a cancer patient amphetamines every time they start to feel bad. And instead of treating the underlying root causes of debt and deflation, they are treating the symptoms and preemptively getting in front of it. What's become shocking is that markets, like Pavlovian have now have a Pavlovian response to this. So you can see this uh, through numerous examples, but markets now have embedded the expectation of central bank reaction function. Um, when VIX went up to 40, the forward curve had the highest level inversion of inversion in history, yeah. far more than 2008, anticipating mean reversion. 
Um, and it and it came. And it came. Yeah. The forward VIX curve essentially bet on a zero percentile outcome. Never before in history had volatility mean reverted as fast as it was predicting, and it was correct. Yeah. But it was it was correct in not vol doesn't mean revert typically that fast over a hundred years worth of data. Um, what it was right in is anticipating the Fed would not raise rates, that China would come in and spend 20% of its GDP supporting its equity markets in the face of a military parade, and that the ECB and the, and the Bank of Japan would have dumbest statements. You have guys like James Bullard coming out. The market drops 5% yeah. in October 2014, and James Bullard is talking QE4. People forget about this. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about central banks preemptively getting ahead, um, this, this is what we're seeing. Markets now build in that expectation. But you have an entire ecosystem. So now, now um, this is a different topic, but central bank preemptive strikes on risk. The second dynamic, share buybacks at their highest levels ever have now actually it eclipsed. just started to roll over too, right? Just started to roll, but they're still, they're, still, yeah. they're still incredibly powerful by any measure of history. I mean, last year, more than the operating earnings of the entire S&P 500 built on share buybacks. I mean, Larry, Larry Fink's talking about, well, if, if, we, if we allow lower taxes and repatriation, will, will companies just, just yeah. buy back just their shares? Shit. Yeah, sure. But what people aren't talking about is that this is a volatility dampener. This actually... When you see, uh, if a company is looking at a scenario and there's and you have a share buyback plan in place, um, if there's any sell-off, you're going to buy into that. Yeah. And so that automatically reduces realized vol. Then you have all of this, all of these um, systematic trading strategies, which are not inherently bad, but when you build in this factor where you have markets anticipating a central bank response, share buybacks. Um, buying, like uh, compressing yeah, the inversion. The market, yeah. And then you have um, VAR rebalancing and systematic VAR rebalancing strategies, CTA strategies, and even machine learning strategies, which are using recent past and risk parity, recent past, in order to um, size their exposure. You have this reflexivity where all these factors are beginning to work in conjunction. Mm -hmm. Then you throw on the prevalence of institutional short volatility sales, which actually produces a gamma position that dealers have to head, which then is furthering. The, so all of these factors play with one another and inter, interplay where lower volatility started by a central bank begets lower vol, but they can all reverse violently on a dime. Yeah, and this is, this is what my concern has been and the thing I've been trying to figure out because um, you know, when you look at ETFs, for example, you know, here's another great dampener on the way up. When we, when we get markets doing what they're doing, everybody's piling into ETFs, the, the, you know, the returns are, are scant, so if you can save some basis points by buying the ETF and save yourself some work figuring out which stock to buy, great. Again, a massive volatility dampener when all these things are just going around and buying the basket, buying the basket. When that does turn, and it will turn, we, we, in, there's no way it doesn't turn. It remains to be seen what reaction the central banks will have because when it turns, and it turns violently, they're going to have to come up with something. I can't even imagine what they're going to come up with. They could lock people, they could lock money in the yeah. system. Yeah, force people to buy treasuries, yeah. capital controls. But it's, we're, we're getting to that point now. We're getting to the point where that's really all they have left at this point. It's going to get draconian. When you look at stuff like this, how do you as a vol trader in a, in a, a time when it's hard to make money being long vol. You can carry it, you can, you can, you can continue to chip away, but you, you must have scratched your head a hundred times thinking, where's the, where's the 70 vol print that we should have had from that? How do, you, how do you carry on and how do you position yourself ready for that moment? Because you know there's a big payday out here. It's sitting out there somewhere. How do you, how do you position yourself for that? Well, I, I think the framework is you find ways to carry vol um, effectively. So I think in this environment, for example, where uh, which is characterized by low volatility but high uncertainty, it allows you to um, sell that first order effect, which is represented by the uncertainty, and recycle it into tail risk. So even though vol is low, 
if we look at um, volturmpremia, for example, skew, these higher order effects, yeah. um, skew, if we, look at, um, if we look at implied correlations, all of these factors are incredibly stretched at the 90th percentile. So this is almost like um, if you imagine, imagine uh, you have a coworker and the man appears calm. And so he doesn't seem to be panicking. He doesn't seem to be erratic. He's just sitting at his desk calmly. That behavior is vol. But if you measured his cortisol levels, his stress hormones, you would see them off the charts. And in, in that sense, that's because he maybe is going to get divorced from his wife. He's afraid he's got tons of debt and he's, he's afraid he's going to get fired. So he's not panicking, but his cortisol levels are elevated. That's what we're seeing today in the market. The cortisol levels are things like implied correlations and skew and vol term premia. These are very expensive, even though vol itself is flat. The problem with this is that if you, if you go ahead and you just buy outright hedges or just outright tail risk, yeah. you're buying that expensive uncertainty yeah. and you're, you're, you're bleeding that, that premium tremendously. So I think the framework that one has to use is one has to be very, very clever about saying, you know what, we are, we're going to not make money if markets drop 3%, but we'll make a ton of money if markets drop 20%. And, or 10%. That's, and you structure trades that, that play off the vol arb in the, in the uncertainty um, that can carry more positively if volatility doesn't realize, while at the same time maintaining that constant exposure. The other way you do it is you couple vol with beta. And I think that's, I, I, and that's to, to us, we don't do that, but most of our accounts are, yeah. are sort of SMA based. And the idea being is that clients would take exposure and layer it on top of beta exposure. That way, um, in the event that you have, uh, in the event that markets continue normally, um, and we end up having a continuation of the bull market, you're realizing that, but you're, you're, you have a, a negative linear exposure combined with a non-linear volatility yeah. exposure that will pay off in a, in a crisis. Now, you, you, you spoke there about risk parity and you spoke about correlation. And, and there was a chart in Prisoner's Dilemma which just astounded me. And, and it's one of those charts you think, you know, anybody that sees this chart is just going to, you know, faint. It's just that, that idea of no correlation between bonds and equities going back over time. It's an astounding chart. I mean, just talk people through it. We'll we'll put the chart up on the thing so they can see it. But it's a, it's remarkable. It's 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 horrifying because one of the things we everyone suspects is risk risk parity. I mean, it's not just risk parity. It's like if I were in Austin, Texas, I go to any brokerage office and I say, well, what should I do with my money? They say, oh, you know, put a 60, 40 64. stock bonds, right? And then if you have a little bit more money, the risk parity guys say, oh, you know, you can lever those bonds and lever the bond exposure and. Combine it with the stock exposure, you get a you get a better overall portfolio. Look how well it performed in two thousand eight yeah. and everything else. Great. So one of the things I said, okay, that's that's fascinating. Um, what if I go back and I look at stock bond correlations going back one hundred and twenty years? Let's see how that relationship has played out over one hundred and twenty years, rather than just over my lifetime. Yeah. Um, it turns out that stocks and bonds. Are more have been more correlated with one another. They've been co highly correlated with one another about 30% of the time. And they're only anti-correlated with one another 11% of the time. It just so happens that the period of anti-correlation has been predominantly since the, starting in the late 1970s all the way yeah. to modern, modern times. And that's really, you had rates peak and rates have gone down and down and down. And every time there's a crisis, central banks lower rates more. So hence this anti-correlation. Now, if we look back across history, there'd be multiple times where stocks and bonds have not only been correlated with one another, but they declined together at the same time. We saw this in the period of 1906 to 1912. We saw this in the 70s, um, where 
you are getting hammered on both sides of your portfolio. So a 60-40 stock bond portfolio becomes 100% right. loser, and a risk parity portfolio becomes a leveraged loser. And this is not some sort of weird pie-in-the-sky theoretical thing. This has happened multiple times across history. So if you are betting on this relationship as an institution, and $14 trillion is betting on this relationship, you're in essence making a bet that U.S. Treasury yields are going to go down to negative 3, negative 4, negative 5%. Could they go down that low? Sure. Anything's possible. But the point is that you are making a levered bet on something that has never happened yeah. in the history of human civilization when I can clearly show a probabilistic expectation of the other scenario happening. This is why I don't understand why volatility and managed futures and contrarian macro, I don't understand in, a, in an environment where everyone is running away from these strategies because they've sort of had mediocre performance over the last couple of years, I feel like institutions should be running to them, yeah. but um, it, this is just human nature, and it's a, a lack of uh, it's recency bias. Well, we, you know, we see this all the time in, in finance. You see it all the time, and and it's funny how you, you've done the work and you've done you have the data to prove this, but you can sense just by reading all the headlines about you know what active management's dead. You all need, we all need passive management now. You know that's a turning point. You, know, you then go and back it up with the data, but you know. At any point in time where everybody's saying, that's done, that's had its day, it's finished. In, in a period like this where we are, there is so much tail risk out there and there's you know, that idea of peace existing on the edge of volatility, which was that great quote that you had in there. You're, you're, I think in the next three or four years, you're going to need an active manager more than you've ever needed an active manager before. I completely agree. Where does that turn come from? What do you think it takes to finally break the market's belief that these preemptive strikes will work? I think there could be any number, any number of breaks that could occur. Um, one of the factors could be a, uh, just a, a, a policy failure, yeah. where we reach a point where we have a large enough crisis and central banks are, and governments are unable to respond. They're unable to respond Either, either politically, because there's so much political opposition, we've seen this rise of populism, or um, they end up having a policy response and the market rejects it. Yeah. Um, so in one aspect, you could have a policy failure that drives it. You could have a political failure. I mean, the rise of populism, um, I mean, there was a, uh, I think one of my articles, and I, I publicly stated this at the EQ Derivatives Conference, saying that I, I didn't predict Trump would win, but I said that he had a very, very high, much higher probability yeah. of winning than, than people were imagining. And I understood this because I come from Michigan, and I understand, you know, my, my, my parents are, are doctors in Michigan, and they, they treat all these people who have been laid off. And it's, it's about jobs. It's about the, yeah. the, the floundering middle class. When people, when people become protectionist, they become xenophobic when their, their security and their financial security is at risk. Um, and this is happening across the developed world. So it's not just, you know, if, if, if Brexit and Trump are Bear Stearns, the breakup of the EU is, is, is really potentially Lehman. Yeah. And um, this is, and, and that leads into a whole other realm of geopolitical risks, including potential war with Russia. And then we're not even including China and the financial state that Japan is. So th these factors really come into play. This could be the tipping point, any one of these, and it could happen politically. Um, you know, at that point, we'll have to see if they, if, they can't, if they can't print into value, do they freeze? And maybe bailing in is their next step on things. Um, but I think this is where we will see, and that's why I think there needs to be sort of a coverage to both right and left tail yes. risk in, in, in both the scenario. Vol, vol is more than just protecting against a 50% decline in markets. Yeah, well, you, know, the, the, you, you assign, that's what you do on a daily basis, you assign probability to events and then handicap accordingly. And, and it's interesting how 
you and I can sit having a conversation about you know potentially World War Three and you know these kind of really extreme events, you know, revolutions in countries that haven't seen revolutions in years. It's all happening. We can see it all happening, but still there's this reluctance to accept it as a probabilistic outcome. Whether the probability is 1%, it doesn't matter. We know the probabilities are rising, yeah. but most investors just have this, there's nothing with a probability of less than 20%. You know what I mean? It's like, well, let me know when the probability is 20% and I'll notice it and I'll try and do something to mitigate it. But until then, I've got bigger fish to fry with my 60-40 over here. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I struggle to understand that mentality, it seems to be shifting to me. It seems to be that 20% barrier to caring is maybe down to 15 now, and you can see it lowering. Yeah. And I, I don't know what it's gonna be, but something out there, whether it's the IMF finally balking at Greece this time around, who knows, but something is gonna come out of the clear blue sky that wasn't expected, wasn't supposed to happen. At that point, what do you think happens to volatility? Because you reintroduced the idea suddenly this one event, it is a volatile one. And maybe Trump is that injection of volatility, which I think he has the potential to be. I, it depends on how the policy events play through. Because in one aspect, you could see, you could see a scenario where in a, I mean, I talk about in an old paper, um, how in, uh, in Germany, right, I'm not predicting hyperinflation in the US, but in a scenario where you have runaway right tail risk, you end up having volatility rise dramatically. Germany, in, during the hyperinflation, would have saw market volatility start at around 19% and would have peaked out at about 2,000% in, in 1923. Um, of course, that's on a nominal basis. Um, the, other, the other scenario would be, I mean, obviously, if there's an outbreak of, of extreme war, you might end up having that left tail. I think as a vol trader, we you can play both ends. What you're betting on is change. So I don't think I'm smart enough to exactly predict uh, how it might play out. But what I'm trying to do in my job is to give people powerful exposure to change in a way that's pal palatable for them to carry so that they're not down 50% carrying it and that they have that exposure to that change on either end of the spectrum. Um, and uh, I think it's incredibly difficult to handicap all the different scenarios. Um, but I, I think if you purposefully seek out positive exposure to change at a low cost, that ultimately, um, ultimately those events can be uh, portfolio and life enhancing. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, you're not cheering for disaster, but, but the idea is to insulate yourself and to to have that positive exposure and nonlinear exposure. Now, for most, for most people at home watching this, there, there'll be a lot of people that have access to vol and, and hopefully we'll be rethinking it as a strategy and rethinking allocating capital to it. But there'll be a lot of people that sit there and think, well, okay, maybe I can buy the VIX ETF or I can sh buy the short VIX ETF if I don't believe in all this. You know, this these, these products that create a liquid instrument around something that's extremely illiquid when you most need it, is another phenomenon that scares the bejesus out of me, frankly. What, what, what advice do you have to people sitting at home trying to understand volatility who are going to get kind of, when, when they Google volatility, it's going to say VIX. You know, you say, stay away from this. Are there better ways to do it? What advice can you give? You know, there's, there's a point. I mean, uh, it's, it's important to sort of not be, um, there's nothing wrong with shorting vol if it's done intelligently. Right. And the problem is that I think the problem is people don't always understand the risks that they're taking on. They're not, they're not imagining. So I think in Prisoner's Lemo, we talked about how the rise of the VIX ETP complex, uh, many, many of these investors don't realize that given the wrong vol spike and given the way that the, uh, the market and the Vega was being placed, uh, back at around 2014, 2015, but the, the exposure that were in the market at that point in time, you could have had even a, uh, a spike that was on par with what happened in February 2007, where VIX went from 12 to 18, yeah. and theoretically the entire short ETP complex could have been wiped out wiped overnight. Out. And those are based on numbers that I, that I put together, and that's my, that's my opinion. Um, I don't feel, I, ironically, I don't feel that way as much now. I think the market has come back and is much more balanced than it was in 2015. But I think the problem at the end of the day is we're, we're all 
short volatility. Yeah. Every institution in the world, is, the question is, are you short convexity or are you massively short convexity? Right. And do you understand that you are? Because you know, we have a finite amount of life. Um, at the end of the day, owning, you know, buying value stocks, you're buying on, buying on dips, you're in essence, you know, sh if you have a portfolio of value stocks, in some ways you're implicitly shorting correlation and, um, and, and betting on mean reversion. That's a form of short vol. But the margin of safety can be attractive at the right points in time. The question is, do people really understand the risk they're taking on? And I think, I think when institutions are uh, entering into a lot of these different strategies, and this in today this is just indexation to a certain extent, I don't think they're they're really fathoming, uh, really uh, have, have a, a pure conceptualization of all the risks hey, that are going on. You, you talk about us all being short vol, and that I have to ask you about your watch because I remember you you writing about your your watch. You know, and sadly, sadly, I'm not wearing it. I'm wearing my Fitbit today. Damn so it. sadly, but yeah, but the ticker is a. I just love this concept of from a cosmology standpoint because um, there's a, a wonderful watch that I that I wear called the ticker, and it counts time. Uh, it, it counts time to your death. Right, which, which people are going to go, wow, that's, that's morbid, but it's, really, it's, but it's such a great idea. It's, a, it's an incredible idea because it's saying, you know, I'm in my 30s, I've, I've got 30 years of, you know, at least solid life. I mean, I can, you can, do, nowadays, life extension and better, right. better dynamic, but, but really in terms of, I'm already at my peak health. I, I'm already at my peak health. So, um, if I'm going to do things, especially things that rely on on uh, being in top physical shape, I better do them now. now. Yeah. The time is finite. Time is our greatest resource. And a lot of times we are afraid to take long convexity bets in life that can have huge payouts but might inconvenience us in the, in the short term. And I think the idea of long ball trading can be applied in the cosmology of life, meaning that it's sometimes about, you know, you go out, you speak to an incredible thinker in Brisbane, and it opens up tremendous new ideas. Yeah. Reaching out to that individual, which takes effort on your part, you're putting something forward, is a, is a long ball trade, and you end up with a convex nonlinear result. Um, so surrounding yourself uh, uh, with with people that, and seeking out people that can expand your horizons, um, purposefully challenging yourself in the short term for nonlinear gains, both uh, intellectually, um, exercise, flossing, meditation, you name it. All of these are examples of you're you're putting some. There's a cost. There's a small time cost, but there's a nonlinearity to the payout. And, and some of that payout can be in the form of random randomness. Yeah. Some of the some of the my closest friends and and most amazing people I've met I've met randomly because I went out some night in New York and I met an interesting person and we kept in touch and became great friends. That's a perfect example. Yeah. Of it, it, nonlinearity. It is. And yeah, this this idea of life is finite and it's not something. I mean, I guess it, it maybe once you get into your thirties and forties you start to think of it that way. And the parallels to volatility trading are just extraordinary to me because when you're young, you don't think about risk. I mean, it's just there is no risk. You're bulletproof and everything's going to be good forever. And, but it doesn't take out. I have this, I have this idea that um, people's careers and certainly their mindset and how they position themselves, how they react to markets is, is shaped by the period when they entered markets. And I was lucky that I came in right before the 87 crash. So wow. I very quickly got punched in the face. Yeah. And that was invaluable to me because you know what can happen. You know that 20% of a stock market can go in a day. Yeah. Anyone that's come into the market since then doesn't know that idea. Even the guys that were around in 2008, they didn't see that kind of drawdown. It was just a, you know, a painful, Lehman was a bad day, but it was one bad day in many. 87 was a bad day and then it almost kind of went away as quick as it, it came. Yeah. What, what advice, as, as a vol trader and someone that has a really good grasp of how this idea of volatility affects your life as well as your investing. What advice can you give people who are perhaps not at the stage where this comes to the natural to think about? Well, I mean, you, you could extend that theory. It's not just lives. I mean, like I, we talk about how all of modern financial engineering has been optimized to a unusual environment of higher stocks, growth, and lower and lower bond prices. But um, 
or excuse me, lower and lower yields. Yields, yeah. Yeah, excuse me. But um, the, uh, so in essence, uh, a lot of times people are always looking in the rear view mirror, but this extends to, uh, like Neil Strauss Howe talks about you know, fourth turning, yeah. like generational cyclums, so entire generations, where a generation embodies certain belief systems, which then, um, which then ensure certain historical mistakes occur over and over again. So I mean, I'll, I'll sit down, I read a lot of financial history, I try to read a lot of history, and then I'll, I play with Bayes' theorem. I'll do this, I'll sit there and I'll do, like I'll, I'll run through different scenarios. What's the probability of the United States going into a civil war in the next 50 years? And what events might drive right. that? And what, what events might cause, uh, you, you could play these games, and I think it's a creative process. Yeah. Um, financial engineering is based always about optimizing to the past, but when I was driving through uh, America, you know, you'd spend two days driving through Iowa and Nebraska, and if you optimize to the past, by the time you hit Colorado, you'd fly off a cliff. Right. So I think the idea of, I mean, I'm a systematic guy, I'm optimizing, but we're always building in fail-safes and trying to imagine systems or imagine a reality that's outside of the systems that have been tested on, and then ensuring that if we hit that alternate reality, it'll help us and not hurt us. And that's, the, that's kind of the power of consistently following a pathway of long ball. This is why I find it fascinating to talk to, to so many people with, with the, you know, the Real Vision Project, is that you get the chance to sit down with people who will entertain the idea, okay, what if the U.S. has a civil war? Most people go, oh, this, is what, that, this is a waste of time. To your point about the, the optionality and actually putting the, the, you know, the convexity you're getting long off by doing that exercise. You know, anyone that thought in 2004 about what might happen if the EU broke up, they, they set themselves up to make some really good money. They thought about Greece, they thought about the weak south and the strong north. Yeah. But it would have seemed like a ridiculous thing to do. Yeah. back in 2004. I mean, there was no stress on it whatsoever. So just in closing, is there anything else out there that, that you're kind of sitting down doing that probabilistic exercise about that you think, wow, I'm really kind of out on a limb here. No one's thinking about this kind of stuff. This is really kind of, I mean, the US Civil War would be a good one. I mean, no one's thinking about that. But is there anything out there that you see as a real, when you, when you spoke about the, the, the Black Swan event being going from fear to horror, yeah. is there any potential horror out there that, that you think yeah, the, the concept of black swan is is completely overused yeah. because, uh, and I think I used the C Cthulhu, like H.P. Lovecraft, yeah. Cthulhu is a metaphor, which is yeah. a, like a horrific monster that's beyond our even ability to comprehend. Because, you know, the, the, the people talk about the black swan event in 2008 as if 2008 was a black swan. I don't think it was no. at all. I mean, I went back and looked at volatility data from the depression and you could clearly see that fall would have touched 80 multiple times during the Great Depression. It was not inconceivable at all. What was the, I think the true black swan in 2008, which didn't happen, but could have happened, would be the failure of the entire yeah. fiat money system. That was, that was the true potential black swan in that sense. Um, and that didn't happen. So the, uh, it's an overused term nowadays. Um, so in my papers, I always end with, um, I, I've always been doing this since 2012, which is, I, I put a, a graphic of liberty leaving the people. Um, and it's not because I'm a socialist. It's because I've always considered um, the real risk to be the failure of our institutions and political risk. And I think that's the real danger of where we might go down, where, um, and I think the true black swan or the true thing is something I'm not even conceiving, yeah. right? I, it's beyond, but I think that's the real risk. And that was, that was hidden in those papers back in 2012. I mean, literally, there were hidden messages in some of those papers. Um, but, um, but I think now when we look at, uh, it seems much more feasible now, but the actual failure of democracy, the actual complete, uh, tumbling of the world order um, where you know you have there's we've existed in this post Bretton Woods system and 
with rising populism, we could see a world 50 years from now that's radically, radically different. Um, and in that, in that world, some of the institutions we take for granted, you know, including the efficacy of democracy, might be challenged. And I think, and, and the very transferability of money and, and across borders and globalism might be challenged in a way that, that um, we've never seen before. And it's very, very hard to, if you're making bets within a financial system, to try to imagine yeah. uh, how, you would, how you would hedge against that potential risk. Or, or even how you would collect if you were right, potentially. Exactly. That's, yeah. I'm so glad you could do this, and I will urge everybody to, to, to seek out the allegory of the prison's dilemma because, and, and uh, volatility in the age of Trump, and I'm going to read the Star Wars piece now because it's, it's some of the clearest thinking that I've read in the last number of years. So, so thanks for sharing it with everybody, and thanks for sharing this out with us. Thank you. I had a great time. 